program today, uh, given the fact that uh, we've got uh, already good uh, turnouts at the time of uh, starting this seminar, we're just thinking of uh, doing something bizarre, which is uh, starting punctually. Um, and with this, I would like to ask our interim director, uh, Ms. Max Yashikawa, to open this up. Thank you, Moritz. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to NEFCO Bangkok office, um, for those who are coming from outside, and also welcome to my own colleagues here in, in the office here in NEFCO. Um, very happy to see a uh, really good turnout, uh, and this is a very unique opportunity we have this afternoon. Uh, it's, the seminar is not only in-person seminar, but I think we have people also connected by Skype, so we're very happy to have a pretty large audience uh, for the seminar in the afternoon. Now, this is uh, one of the activities that uh, NECMAP, our network on assessment quality monitoring the specific region, is organizing. And NECMAP, for those, I, I hope everyone is familiar with NECMAP. Yes, that there's no need to explain anything more uh, right now, but just to remind you that the NECMAP has you know, three core activities in the field of capacity development and research and knowledge sharing. And I think this seminar really contributes to all of them in many ways, and hope that uh, you will very uh, you will take good active participation in the seminar. Now I have a, a great honor and uh, to have such a distinguished presenters today, uh, Dr. Randy Bennett, uh, from the president of the International Association for Education Assessment, or IAEA in short, and I think we're much familiar with the term IAEA, <laughs> and uh, and also Mr. Frank. Scientists, the head of the international department of um, CITO, I think so. CITO is correct, right. yeah, yeah, in Netherlands, and uh, and of course with our NECMAP members uh, connected through Skype. Uh, IAE is an associate member of NECMAP, and we have been discussing about holding this special seminar for some time. So I'm very happy that uh, this has been materialized uh, in this way, and also that this is a great um, kind of a uh, way to demonstrate the ownership of our members, uh, both members and social members of the network. I think NECMAP, UNESCO may be actually hosting secretariat, but of course it's not UNESCO's thing. It's the, the NECMAP is for everyone uh, for, for taking good ownership of the activities. So we would like to focus today, uh, the seminar this afternoon, on the topic of computer-based testing, or CBT. Uh, I think most of us have heard about CBT a lot of times, but it's really a great, you know, kind of very trendy thing to talk about. But myself, I'm also a pretty newcomer to really discuss the details around it. Uh, first, uh, sorry, um, sorry, just very short introduction. Those who are connected by Skype, please mute your microphones. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Boris. So first, uh, while CBT can be applied and put into practice in a variety of circumstances, um, I hope the people at Skype are connected well. They the, hear those, us? those who are connected by Skype, please, please move to microphones because we can uh, hear mm -hmm. you here. Yeah. I hope the connection is good enough. Uh, if there's any connection problems, can I hear for those who are connected to Skype? Please also kind of alert us somehow. I think there's usually a little button to alert us that you know, yep. wave hand or something on the screen. Anyway, so um, it can be used in, in different um, occasions and circumstances. But one of the applications we also want to, to look into is CBT as an assessment for learning and a, a tool that learners can also play with tests and not just to become familiar with it. It could be something that we can also learn from them and through times, and also see how the feedback can work to improve our learning processes as well. I think CBT can also put learners in charge of their learning processes. So the word maybe tests might frighten some people, yeah. but hopefully CBT is not just about kind of being assessed by some computer program, but hopefully it will be uh, a tool that can encourage and stimulate proactive self-directing learning at the same time. So maybe one day we have to consider what the name should be, actually. <laughs> uh, the word test also frightens a lot of people, even if it's not only about you know, making any judgment as such. So I'm afraid I personally cannot stay very long. I'm sorry, I have, I'm currently wearing two hats. 
I kind of failed to introduce myself properly at the beginning, but uh, I'm here to represent as the officer in charge for UNESCO Bangkok, but I also wear another hat called the Section T for Inclusive Quality Education, where this NECMAP um, secretary is hosted, and also where Moritz is uh, now leading the quality education team under the section. So I think it would be um, uh, more justifiable to ask Morris to give uh, the technical details on the seminar and also to uh, bring you, take you through the, the brief agenda and then have the event, uh, <laughs> the agenda to take, uh, to, to start off. So thank you once again for participation. I hope you enjoyed the seminar and also look forward to hearing a lot of your good feedbacks so that we can also um, the other opportunities for other opportunities to have another kind of seminar in the coming year. Thank you very much. So, off to you, Boris. Thank you. Thank you very much for, the mic, uh, for this welcome uh, notes. And, and just to ask, uh, to, to add to uh, Marky's uh, words, uh, I'd also like to say a warm welcome to our distinguished presenters, uh, uh, Randy uh, Bennett, president of the IAEA. Not to be confused with the very famous IEA, which is different, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or the other IAEA. <laughs> and there's also an the EAEA. Anyway, there's yes, the explosion. <laughs> explosion. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, as well as uh, Mr. Franz Kleintjes, whom I admitted brought some nostalgia back because I, I did one of his tests 20 years ago. Anyway, for first few uh, household remarks, uh, emergency exits are downstairs if anything happens, which we don't expect. You can uh, run down towards your safety. Uh, bathrooms just outside the meeting room for men, uh, on the other side for uh, women. Uh, notice that the event will be recorded. In, uh, uh, it will be also transmitted by, by Skype, but it, it, it will also be recorded and uh, published as a podcast on our website. Uh, and um, if you would like to know more about NECMAP, I understand that all of you already know quite a lot about a network, but then, then you can look at the brochure which we've just left outside. Note that that brochure is for the years 2015 and 2000, sorry, 2014, 2015, 2016. So it reflects what we did several years ago, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But for the latest, uh, you can obviously refer to our uh, website. Uh, very briefly, computer based testing. Why? Obviously, um, by setting up the platform for this uh, presentation, or by this, these two presentations, we're not necessarily saying as NECMAP that computer based testing is something that we should be doing. But it is something that we should be discussing, that we should be talking about, and that we should uh, know more about because it is advancing in several assessments national assessments and international assessments. And Randy will take us uh, through some of those examples in, in just a bit. Uh, but there are a few things that we can actually gain from computer-based testing that will be quite difficult uh, to have access to with uh, paper-based testing. And Marky already uh, mentioned some overarching uh, benefits. Uh, for example, the fact that computer-based testing as an integrated part of computer-based learning uh, can help the learner director of learning also become obviously comfortable with, with, with test items and get instant feedback. Uh, there is uh, also benefits related to, to, to efficiency, uh, which I think especially uh, France will talk a little bit um, in more detail about. Uh, and there's also benefits related to the fact that uh, the variety of items that people can be exposed to with computer-based testing is much larger than with paper-based testing. And in the latest version that I've seen of France's presentation, he will actually give us a few examples of that, uh, where we can have access to multimedia items we can have simulations, uh, collaboration, teamwork, a lot of things that we can now assess uh, through these uh, CBT uh, uh, tests that are a little bit more difficult when we're just uh, having access to uh, pen and paper based uh, testing. And we also believe as NECMAP that one final reason why CBT should at least be on our agenda and we should be thinking about it, should be discussing, even though the word testing, as uh, Mark already said, you know, sometimes uh, it is a little bit uh, tricky and, and we should be careful in using it, is simply the fact that we live in a society where we're surrounded by computers, we're surrounded by IT, uh, we're surrounded by high technology, and we should in somehow, uh, in some way learn to deal with it. And computer-based testing can be a part of that, uh, can be a part of that tapestry. Um, I've already briefly talked about what uh, Randy and Franz are going to address uh, with us today. Uh, Randy will start with telling us what the IAEA is, 
uh, he will say a few things about the transition to computer-based testing first in the United States and then internationally in tests like PISA, TIMS, and PEARLS, and then uh, give us a few reasons why we should think that computer-based testing is important and can be useful. Uh, then Franz will explain to us in more detail what uh, CITO is about and what CITO is uh, doing. It will say a little bit about the potential added value of uh, computer-based testing uh, from CITO's perspective, which has made a transition, if I'm correct, Franz, uh, to computer-based testing in the year 2008. Ten years before, late 90s. All right, that was a bit of a miss there. <laughs> uh, the uh, PBT surely will explain in greater detail. Mm -hmm. Then we'll talk a little bit about test development, as well as uh, innovative uh, items. Uh, finally, there will be, uh, when we look at the agenda, uh, the, the presentation by Randy. Then there will be a question and answer session, another presentation, another question and answer session. And when you look at the time allotted to the question and answer session, you can see that we allot as much time to that as to the presentation. Why? Because we want this to be an interactive event. Uh, our colleagues uh, Lindsay, um, uh, Nan, it's not, she's sitting outside at the moment, uh, will be circulating with, uh, with uh, wireless microphones uh, to ask you for questions, uh, to make this into a debate. The persons who are uh, participating by Skype are also very much uh, requested to participate in this debate. Uh, our colleague Nadia, who was, by the way, a very important pillar in organizing this event, is monitoring together with Lindsay over there uh, the Skype connection. Any questions coming through at the question and answer session, she will let us know what they are uh, so that we can have this uh, discussion. Uh, with this, I invite Dr. Randy Brennan to commence his presentation. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, with you. And uh, my thanks to uh, NECMAP and UNESCO uh, for uh, allowing us uh, this opportunity. As uh, Moritz said, I'm going to talk about uh, computer-based testing around the world. And I'm going to try just to give an overview of the different kinds of computer-based testing programs uh, that are occurring at uh, different levels, primarily for uh, assessment of uh, student competencies for trying to understand better what students know and can do at uh, an international level, at a country level, uh, at a state level. I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, uses of computer-based assessment for more formative classroom assessment-oriented purposes. Those, those are very important. Uh, we could spend uh, an entire seminar on those, and maybe that's something to think about uh, for next year. But what I'll do today uh, is pretty much talk about two things. I'll give a very short introduction to IAEA so you understand what that is. And then I'll spend uh, my 15 or 20 minutes giving a brief tour of computer-based testing around the world uh, for the uh, purposes that I just uh, mentioned. So what is IAEA? IAEA is the International Association for Educational Assessment, was established in 1974 to foster communication among the agencies throughout the world that are concerned with the use of assessment for understanding educational processes and education and providing a framework within which those agencies uh, can cooperate. The membership of IAEA is, is institutional, that is its organizations, its ministries of education, its uh, assessment agencies associated with uh, national governments uh, and its uh, nonprofit measurement organizations and uh, a few uh, for-profit measurement organizations. In addition, there are a small number of individuals uh, that join also. The mission, the current mission of IAEA is to advance through professional interchange the science and practice of educational assessment by organizations around the world. IAEA is a UNESCO NECMAP associate member, and we're an associate member because uh, we're located outside the region, though we do have IAEA members uh, that are inside the region. So now moving on to computer-based testing. 
IAEA members are among the leading organizations in the field of computer-based testing, uh, some of them running uh, quite large computer-based testing programs and contributing to the transition of paper testing programs uh, to computer. I'm going to talk about the three types of uh, assessment programs, and IAEA members are involved in each of these uh, types. Uh, as uh, either the uh, overseeing agency or one of the uh, contractors uh, that helps to implement these uh, assessment programs. So I'll talk about state testing programs in uh, the United States, including uh, two groups of states called consortia. One is the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium. The other is the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers. I'll talk about national testing programs, uh, the U.S. National Assessment of Education and Progress and the Australian MAPLAN Online Program, and then I'll say a few words about the international testing programs. So we'll start with the uh, state testing programs in the U.S. Smarter Balanced uh, is a consortium of 14 uh, U.S. states and jurisdictions. It was funded in 2010 by the U.S. Education Department with an allocation of $180 million. And that $180 million was intended to be devoted to the creation from scratch of an assessment program for students in grades 3 through 8 and once in high school in English language arts and mathematics for purposes of understanding how well individual schools, districts, and states were at educating their students, and for understanding how effectively they were closing achievement gaps among different demographic groups of students. The first operational Smarter Balanced uh, Online Assessments were administered in 2015, so that's five years later, and they're administered now each year, each spring, uh, on school equipment, so on equipment that uh, is located in each school. And because Smarter Balanced is a census assessment, every student in those grades, three through eight, and one grade in high school, takes the assessment. This is a press release from one of the Smarter Balanced states. It's from the, the biggest state, it's the biggest state in the United States, and it's the biggest state in Smarter Balanced, California. Uh, California has about 30 million uh, people uh, in, in the state, uh, so it's uh, larger than, than many countries. Uh, and what's interesting about uh, California uh, is uh, it's a demonstration, I think, of the fact that online testing can be done at very large scale. Uh, this news release is dated September 27, 2017, and it's titled, State Schools Chief Tom Torlakson Announces Results of California Assessment of Student Progress and Performance Online Tests. California testing went smoothly for 3.2 million total students. On a single day, May 9, 2017, nearly half a million students took the online tests, the largest single day of such assessments ever. So uh, it's uh, interesting simply from the perspective of scale. The second main consortium, that is groups of states that are undertaking uh, computer-based assessment and doing it uh, as a group for purposes of, of gaining efficiencies of scale is called PARC, uh, the uh, Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers. Uh, it's a consortium of now seven states and jurisdictions. It was funded in 2010 uh, also by the U.S. Education Department with another $180 million. So that's in total $360 million going to create these two large assessment programs. Again, uh, it went operational in 2015, delivering on school equipment. 
So now let's move to national assessment programs so you can get a sense of what is happening in some of those uh, programs. Uh, this is uh, a picture of students taking the National Assessment of Educational Progress in uh, the United States. And uh, you'll notice that uh, every student in this classroom, this is the library uh, or school library, uh, is using uh, a, a tablet computer with a detachable keyboard. NAEP is not a census. NAEP is a sample survey. So uh, at it, it samples, uh, like PISA, uh, a subset, in fact a small subset of the schools in the United States, but does it uh, in a probability sampling fashion. Mm -hmm. And within each of those sample schools, it samples a small number of students. Uh, NAEP is delivered on NAEP equipment. So an administrator brings to the school the 30 or so computers you see here in a what's called a Pelican case. It's like a large suitcase. And every student who takes the National Assessment of Educational Progress in the United States takes it on the same exact machine. So there is no difference from one student to the next in the type of computer or the way that the software is running or displaying uh, uh, for any individual. It's not the case for Park and Smarter Balance, which are delivering on school computers that may be different from one student to the next within a school, or from one school to the next, or one district to the next, or one state to the next. NAEP is transitioning all of its assessments from paper to computer. The research to uh, transition NAEP began in 2001, so that's uh, 18 uh, years or so ago, 17 or 18 years or so ago, and the main reading and uh, mathematics assessments, the operational ones, just began uh, to be delivered by computer. So that's some um, 18 or so years later. NAEP's transition was very gradual. It began with that research. Uh, several years later, uh, NAEP began administering small uh, operational assessments on computer, and it's only in 2017 that the mainline uh, administrations uh, went online. The reading and math uh, assessments uh, given online last year to about 150,000 students throughout the United States on these NAEP tablets being brought into schools, and then uh, the uh, writing assessment to about 20,000 students on the NAEP tablets. NAEP was administered online in grades 4 and grade 8. All of the NAEP assessments are intended to be uh, online by uh, next year. Something that's uh, interesting about NAEP is that it includes a, a very significant number of non-multiple choice questions. Uh, constructed responses of various types, but also uh, performance tasks of one kind or another. The 2014 NAEP Technology and Engineering Literacy Assessment uh, delivered scenario-based tasks that had students engage in uh, performances of one type or another, including uh, simulations. Uh, this assessment was administered to about 20,000 students in grade 8 on uh, those NAEP tablets, and it included uh, tasks uh, revolving around problems like having students <coughs> explore uh, population growth in Chicago. Uh, or design a safe bike lane for a uh, urban area, or create an ideal habitat for an iguana, or promote a teen recreation center, meaning uh, create uh, an advertisement for a uh, teen recreation center. The Australian uh, National Assessment Program uh, is moving uh, its assessment to uh, computer from paper in years 3, 5, 7, and 9. And that uh, transition is beginning 
this year in 2018 with the online literacy and numeracy assessments. And what uh, is very interesting to me about the NAPLAN is that it's the only uh, significant assessment that I know of that is being administered not only on school equipment but also on personally approved student uh, I, I mean approved student devices or approved personal devices. Uh, that's a very unusual development and it would be interesting to see uh, how that proceeds. Now moving to the international assessments. Uh, PISA, uh, which uh, I believe you must all be uh, familiar with, the Program for International Student Assessment, was given in 2015 in 90 language versions on school equipment to about 400,000 students. 15-year-olds uh, in 57 or so countries uh, or economies in reading, math, science, problem solving, and uh, financial literacy. Uh, PISA includes simulation tasks in its uh, science assessment. What's unique about PISA, at least to me, is the large uh, number of languages in which the assessment is administered. So uh, those who are uh, developing PISA uh, seem to have come a long way toward meeting the challenges associated with uh, languages that are character-based, languages that are alphabetic, languages that run, run left to right, right to left, uh, languages for which one can uh, say uh, the same meaning in a very compact number of words versus other languages in which that same thing takes many, many more words, which has implications for display of, uh, say, a reading passage to students, the amount of scrolling they may have to do to see and process that pair passage, and the potential effects on the meaning of assessment results. Here's an example of a screen from a PISA science uh, simulation task. And the problem calls for students to determine whether it would be safe or unsafe to run while drinking water with the air humidity at 50% and the air temperature at 40 degrees uh, centigrade. And to answer the problem, the students run a simulation. And the simulation allows them to manipulate three variables, air temperature, air humidity, and whether or not the runner is drinking water. And what the students have to do is run that simulation and then use the results of the simulation to answer uh, the question. And uh, the first part of the question is, is it safe or unsafe? The second part of the question is to justify your uh, answer uh, with, uh, by citing the particular lines of data that, uh, that, uh, just, that help you uh, make, that led you to that conclusion. And then finally, you have to explain in words why that data supports that conclusion. A second international assessment that's of interest is the Progress in International uh, Literacy Study, which was given to 85,000 or so fourth graders in 16 education systems on school computers to measure online informational reading. And what I think is interesting about ePearls, the e-version of Pearls, is that the focus is on online reading. So in contrast to the way we've been measuring reading on paper for many, many years, uh, the focus here is not on linear reading, but on reading that is done non-linearly. So if you look at this screen from ePearls, which is on sort of to the right of uh, this display, uh, you can see, or well, maybe you can't see because it's so small, uh, that there are hyperlinks in the text, that there are tabs that allow you to visit different web pages and go through the uh, text in, a, in the way that you would uh, as you uh, might if you were uh, reading off of uh, the internet in a non-linear fashion. So uh, that uh, window that you see, 
right here, uh, is intended to uh, simulate uh, an internet browser, and there is a simulated internet behind this window that allows students to visit some web pages and, uh, vis uh, and display text for themselves uh, by clicking on different uh, hyperlinks. The online reading passages allow them to see content that helps them complete uh, the questions, respond to the questions that they're being uh, given. Uh, the navigation is nonlinear, as I mentioned. On the right is an assessment window that uh, guides the students through the assignment that they're being given or the questions, captures how it is they're moving through these pages, which pages they are visiting, what it is they're responding, what their responses are, and uh, what the timing is with respect to uh, each action that they take. Something that we can do in computer-based assessment that we could never do before is now uh, record and analyze and make inferences from the process that students are using to solve the problems that they are presented. And process uh, analysis affords, affords some very interesting opportunities. There are instances in which uh, process is really what it is we want to judge because the process is the essence of uh, problem solving. So in scientific inquiry, for example, the process is critical. How it is I choose to go about conducting an experiment makes all the difference in the world because if I arrive at a result, but I arrive at that result in a faulty fashion, that result is meaningless even if it is the right result. There are other activities in which the process is incidental. It's really the end result that's important. So in essay writing, what is judged is the essay that I present. But if the essay that I present is not adequate, then it may be the case that looking at the process I use to get there will be helpful to a teacher or a student and understanding how to come to a better end result. If I'm not editing, if I'm not reading what it is that I have written, that's important information for a teacher to understand. And it's important information for a student to understand, to become more reflective about his or her writing process. And that's something that we can now do from uh, online assessment that we can never do before. The transition of a third international assessment, uh, TIMS, will begin in 2019, next year, with about half of the countries participating in TIMS uh, expected to take a tablet and stylus-based stylus version of the assessment and then transition will be complete in 2023. TIMS is interesting because it's implementing a dual system, which is very unusual. Countries can choose either eTIMS or the paper-based uh, version. Uh, the device that TIMS is being on, I mentioned, was a tablet uh, with a stylus. A keyboard is optional for the higher grades. So TIMS is using essentially a NAEP model in which the administrators will bring the machine to schools. So the last things that I'll say are why. Why are testing programs making this transition uh, to computer? And I think that there are multiple reasons that include measuring existing competencies more effectively and efficiently, or at least the hope that that can be done. The hope that we can measure new competencies that we couldn't measure before like reading online in a nonlinear fashion, or writing on computer, which people have to do in many occupations today and in 
many uh, uh, fields of study in higher education. And the like measuring with uh, delivery and response methods that are similar to the ones that are used uh, certainly in employment settings or many employment settings and uh, in many of the learning activities that students are either beginning to do or have been doing depending upon uh, their location in the world. So to summarize, computer-based testing has come or is coming to international assessments like PISA, PEARLS, and TIMS. It's coming to national assessments like uh, the US National Assessment of Educational Progress and the Australian NAPLAN. It's coming to state assessments uh, like the Smarter Balanced uh, Consortium, the PARC Consortium, uh, and individual states that I didn't talk about uh, like Utah and Virginia. Some testing programs have brought computers to schools like NAEP. Some have used school machines like Smarter Ballast and Park. Some have done a combination of the two and some have even included students' personal equipment like NAPLAN. Early adopters took considerable time to reach full implementation. Uh, the state of Virginia began its transition in 2000 and it wasn't until 2010 that uh, virtually all students in the state were taking uh, assessments on computer. NAEP took even longer. Later adopters have taken considerably less time. So Smarter Balanced and Park, for example, took just under uh, five years to make the transition, but recognized that they had very significant resources in the form of those very large uh, grants of money with which to make that transition happen in a rapid fashion. Ado adopters of computer-based testing have succeeded in part because they planned to fail. They planned to fail early, often, small, and gracefully. That is, they did lots and lots of small pilots and experiments that allowed them to gradually understand how to deliver tests on computer in an effective and efficient manner. So I'll stop right there and uh, we can take or discuss any uh, issues or questions that you wish. Thank you very much. Dr. Bennett and Deeps uh, with us. Uh, just to make sure that we don't have too many presentations at the same time, no interactive elements, the floor is open for questions. Then my colleague uh, Lindsay Han will be circulating with the wireless microphone. So please feel free to raise your hand if you would like to ask anything. And uh, Nadia Nyanko is uh, monitoring any questions that might come in through uh, Skype. Friends, we also received some questions here from Eva. You could also send questions from email if you're connected. And if nobody will raise their hands, then I'll start with these questions. But I'm sure that people have got questions here as well. Yes, excellent. This is Chris Thatcher. Yes, well, you're all ready to use the microphone. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> it's there. Um, good afternoon. I, I did some work years ago with a company in the UK uh, on assessment. But it was assessment for learning rather than assessment of learning. And many of the systems that you've described are assessment of learning. They're actually designed top down, if you like, to allow states or to allow uh, national organizations to make assumptions or make draw conclusions about the level of ability of the students. I'm more concerned, actually, with the, the power that technology has to influence and design, if you like, almost a curriculum at an individual level so a student can move through at whatever rate is appropriate to their development uh, rather than being determined by some, um, almost some organization in the cloud that says this is what you should be doing and this is where you should be. Um, I'd appreciate your comments on that. Well, I think both 
are important. In fact, I think both are critical and one can't really exist very well without the other. Uh, we need assessments of learning if we're going to understand uh, whether education systems are functioning effectively, uh, including systems at the school and classroom level. Uh, in the U.S., it, uh, there was a long period of time in which we had no idea uh, whether individual schools were effectively serving all students in those schools. Uh, there were many cases in which schools in very good neighborhoods had, on average, very high achievement. But when we finally started looking, at the achievement of demographic groups within those very good schools, it turned out that some of those very good schools weren't doing such a very good job with students from minority groups or students who had disabilities or students who were English learners. So assessment of learning serves a very, very important purpose, at least for us. Now, I agree with you uh, 100% that assessment for learning is equally important. And I think there are some very innovative ways that we can facilitate that goal within, through uh, assessment uh, that is electronic in nature or being delivered online. And one of those ways is through the process analysis uh, that I was describing. We're doing a lot of work uh, at ETS in the analysis of students' writing processes because we're trying to understand uh, how it is that students who are not writing effectively uh, go about uh, producing their writing. And we're trying to do that not only in the context of uh, single session writing assessment, which is what you normally see on a, a summative test, but also in the context of uh, multi-session formative types of activities. And uh, by way of watching that process and recording that process and playing it back for students and teachers so we can show a student and a teacher, this is how the student got to that essay. We think we can facilitate a self-reflection that uh, we haven't been able to facilitate before. If you think about uh, sports and how it is that uh, players and coaches operate today, uh, at least in the US, performance replay is universal. Every professional team, even the amateur teams, uh, and every individual sport Individual performance and team performance is recorded, and the coach and the players analyze that recording to try and understand better how that performance can be improved. And I think there are kinds of problem solving, such as scientific inquiry, such as writing, where we can begin to do some very similar things. And I think that will be a very important contribution to assessment for learning. Thank you very much. There are several other questions coming in, I believe, by uh, Skype, and now they will let us know what they are. But first, uh, maybe uh, our colleague, uh, Yongmi Park. Hello, uh, my name is Yongmi from ICC and Education Team. Um, so thank you very much for a very informative presentation. I learned a lot from your presentation. Uh, my question is actually related to uh, the question from the gentleman on the back side. Um, so um, I think analyzing the process is not an easy thing uh, for teachers and also graders as well. And um, for some teachers, probably they don't want to know the process. They just want to know the result or the answer of the student. Mm -hmm. uh, although they know that process is very important. Um, would um, your organization give any like capacity building or training for teachers or graders to to analyze the process well? Or even better, is is there any like uh, AI or big data related uh, automatic grading system that can 
that's in the burden of the teachers. That's the okay. first question. And then the second question would be uh, um, um, the NAEP um, questions, simple questions you gave us was really, really great. Uh, for example, how to build a bike path in a park or how to save the uh, habitat of the eagle and all those kind of things. Um, also, uh, my question goes to the grading part of it. Uh, how, how would you grade those questions and how would you see which question is better than the other? That's a good question. Thank you. Okay, there's a lot there. Okay, so uh, with respect to the second question, which is uh, how do you grade questions uh, that are performance uh, tasks uh, presented on a computer. Uh, the way that we would typically begin doing that would be to go back to the design of the question itself. So what is it that uh, we want to make claims about with respect to that question? When we design the question, what is it that, what, what are the skills, competencies, knowledge, processes, strategies, habits of mind that we're trying to measure? And then we start to think about, okay, so what can, how, how can we, what task can we create that will produce evidence that we can use to make inferences about those particular competencies, processes, strategies, habits of mind? So once we have that clearly specified, and that takes a lot of work to make that specification, uh, which means that creating tasks like the ones that I just described briefly is a very labor-intensive process. Next comes, well, okay, so we observe the evidence. How do we judge that evidence? Which means that there's going to be a very detailed rubric, which means we're going to have to take that rubric and either use human judges to assign grades or some other type of uh, categorization to the evidence we observe from students, or we're going to have to implement that same rubric in a computer algorithm. And that, again, is going to take a significant amount of thought and uh, time and labor. So that's all being done in the context of NAEP, in the context of PISA, in the context of the kinds of assessments that, tr that are trying to use these types of tasks. But as I say, at the moment, it's an expensive and time-consuming thing to do. Can AI help? Uh, yes, uh, AI is now being used uh, fairly routinely in the grading of students' essays, for example. And uh, it does a, a not bad job. And <clears throat> it does a not bad job in the following sense. Uh, AI programs can predict with uh, reasonable accuracy the uh, score that a human judge would assign to an essay. But the way that the AI program does that is not the way that a, that a trained, uh, careful human judge would do it. And that uh, could be, or can be, a problem in certain circumstances. So for example, one uh, variable that AI programs typically use is the number of words in the essay. The number of words in the essay is a very good predictor of the grade that a human judge will assign to an essay. But just because I add more words to my essay doesn't necessarily make it better. So we have to be very careful about the ways in which we use things like AI scoring until that scoring uh, improves to the point where it can actually understand what it is that it's scoring, because now it can't. Thank you so much, Randy. Let's give a chance to our participants to Skype. My colleague Nares has to be, I've got some interesting inputs. Yes, we have right now two questions. You want me to read out both of them at once, or one by one? 
I was just thinking, in the interest of time, yeah, maybe all the ones. Well, yeah, sure. Um, so the first question is coming from David Ram from Nepal, I believe. Um, uh, his question is, what about the cost of assessment in school based? Uh, sorry, computer based testing. About the cost. The second question is coming from Mi Young Khan. I think it's his one. He's here in India. So the question is, are there a particular are there particular areas uh, computer based testing are more effective? Or are there uh, the same question or for uh, paper and pencil uh, based tests are more effective? So if there are, should or could paper based testing and computer based testing be compatible? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, so, compatible, uh, that word to me uh, suggests complementary. And to me, there are ways in which computer-based computer testing or more traditional methods can be very complementary uh, with uh, paper-based testing. Paper and computer-based testing can be complementary in the sense that there are some things we can do in paper context that we can't easily do in computer context, and some things we can do in computer context that we can't do on paper. So if there are things that, uh, if there are educational goals that uh, your system has, that can't be assessed in a traditional format, then computer becomes uh, critical. If, if you're interested in assessing students' ability to problem solve with technology, to use technology as a tool in writing, in reading, in uh, modeling problems mathematically uh, with spreadsheets, then uh, computer becomes uh, essential. But there are other uh, kinds of activities in which a uh, computer is incidental and maybe uh, not at all helpful. So uh, there are ways in which the two can be compatible. With respect to the question of cost, cost is a very, very significant issue. Uh, and that's why it took $180 million for Smarter Balance and uh, Park each to create uh, their assessments. Uh, the purchase of computers for schools uh, so that all students can take an assessment on computer is very significant. And that $180 million didn't include the cost of hardware or software for schools. That was only the development cost for the assessments. So it takes a long, part of the reason the transition takes as long as it's been taking in the US is because of the gradual amount, the, the long amount of time and the large amount of cost it's taken to bring technology into schools. And uh, that is something that uh, will be, technology is something that has been com becoming cheaper, much cheaper over time so that uh, schools can more easily afford to uh, give students uh, computers or make them available. So I think that will be less of a problem, uh, but it will still, for many countries, uh, take a significant amount of time to uh, meet that challenge of cost. Thank you very much, Randy. Before moving on to uh, Francis' presentation, we've got five more minutes. For questions, I've got one question here which arises a question from Romania and which uh, seems very interesting and I would like to mention it. Uh, but before doing so, is there any other question from any participants here? I don't want you to use the opportunity to uh, ask questions to, to Randy uh, before uh, we move on to France's presentation. That the resounding no? All right. Uh, so, Simona Nicolaescu from the University of Bucharest asks us, asks uh, Dr. Bennett, how can computers, uh, computerized testing presumably, bring closer classroom collective rather than distance peer relations? And I think that this question is a little bit referring to the fear that uh, computers drive persons apart. And sorry, I'm, I'm just going to refer to something that I think is more or less common knowledge, that ETS, or wasn't common knowledge from me, uh, one hour ago, but the ETS is the contractor of the PISA tests, uh, one of the other hats that 
Dr. Bennett is wearing is uh, an EPS chair in you know, innovative assessments. Uh, and I understand that in the latest PISA assessments, they were items on teamwork, on uh, collaborative, uh, on co co collaboration basically. So, keeping that in mind, um, how would you answer this question from the mm. uh, first? Yeah, that's a very good question. It goes back to the uh, first question about uh, using uh, computers uh, in, in assessment uh, for learning. Uh, so one thing that we can do, uh, which we couldn't do uh, very easily before, is uh, engage in uh, peer review and collaboration, uh, not only within classrooms, but across classrooms, across schools, across countries, uh, which uh, can be very exciting. We can have students uh, uh, write essays responding to a uh, common uh, problem and have uh, peers in other schools, uh, in other countries, who are also uh, learning the same language, learning to write in the same language, give feedback and begin to uh, interact with one another in ways that uh, we couldn't ever do uh, with uh, our uh, current technologies. So I think that's uh, one way in which we can uh, use computers to foster uh, greater interaction, collaboration, and uh, togetherness. That's a fantastic answer. We're uh, scarcely uh, functional today. Uh, we're planning to run that with the closest question and answer session at 3 o'clock. Uh, we're actually three minutes uh, short of uh, 3 o'clock. Um, just one last question to my UNESCO colleagues. Is there any questions from our own ranks? Or shall we then move on to the last presentation? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, do you think that copy based testing for the national assessment can be taken multiple times across the years? Oh, that's such that's such a good question, and uh, I do. Uh, you know, we have uh, for a long, long time uh, conceptualized assessment, or at least the uh, assessment of learning, as a singular event that occurs at the end, typically at the end of the year, or uh, in the case of national assessment, sometimes it's in uh, the middle of a year. But there is no reason why instead of giving an assessment, uh, a long assessment at the end of uh, a year, there's no reason why we couldn't give shorter problem-solving episodes at various times during the year, uh, and then accumulate the results across the year to try and make uh, inferences about what it is that students know and can do. And uh, perhaps if we can distribute uh, assessment more over time, uh, we can serve assessment functions that are both of learning and for learning more effectively. Thank you so much. Randy, that, that was fantastic. Uh, the true, uh, sorry, one more question. Thank you very much. My name is Kiki Kiki and I'm from the Teacher Council in Thailand. Um, at the moment, our office responsible for uh, giving license for teachers. Uh, one of the issues that we're working on is to have all the grad, all the students who finish university before they get the license, they have to take a test. There are three areas that we are thinking of taking a test. One is knowledge. Second is skill, and the third one is character. The one that we're struggling with is skill. They're talking about how we can record, because in order to find out the student has a skill is to record them and put them in the and all of them. Are there any example of testing on a, or a CBT that have that type of format that we can learn to measure skills and different skills that sometimes you cannot measure by different touch, but observing of their behavior and looking at through YouTube or a video clips or something like that. 
Yeah, in, uh, in the U.S., something uh, EPS has been developing is something called the National Observational uh, Teacher Examination. And uh, one component of that examination is a uh, performance assessment in which uh, the teacher candidate interacts with a small group of simulated students. And the teacher has to uh, essentially teach a little lesson uh, to the students in, in a particular uh, subject matter, uh, either English or mathematics, I think are the two current ones. And uh, what the teacher does is uh, evaluated, how it is the teacher goes about uh, teaching those students, the questioning that the teacher does, uh, the way the teacher uh, interacts with uh, those uh, simulated students. The students are simulated by actors who have a script about how to respond uh, to the particular uh, lesson that uh, the subject matter that the student, the teacher is intending to uh, communicate. And uh, the teacher's uh, actions are recorded and those actions are later uh, evaluated by human judges. So that's a very uh, intense, labor intensive and again costly uh, approach. Uh, but that, that's one way to try and understand better uh, the skills aspect of teaching. Something that I think is very important with respect to trying to understand the skills aspect of a teacher is not to separate the skills from the subject matter that the teacher is intending to teach. They go together in a very intimate fashion and trying to separate them too much I think, uh, can create uh, difficulties. Excellent. With that, if there are no more questions, um, thank you very much, Randy. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. Uh, you will stay here with us because in the final Q and A, we may again refer back to you. But for now, the floor is uh, Francis. Good afternoon or good morning. Or good, after, or good evening, I don't know where you're all listening to this uh, uh, broadcast. It's very exciting for us. Uh, you, you saw us just hustle a little bit because we are struggling with the broadcast in the sense of I have a full screen in front of me. Uh, so the next sheet is not only a surprise to you, but also to me. So please bear with me a little bit. Uh, and after one hour of intensive listening, um, I will try to um, tell you something where, where I'm from. Um, I'm from CITO, the Dutch, educational, uh, Dutch Institute for Educational Measurement, and we are based in the Netherlands. And the Netherlands is a very small country. Um, we have uh, our institute, um, if, you, if you can just watch the map of, um, of Holland, near to the east, to the east, to the German border, and um, we were founded in 1968, privatized in 1999. And what is our connection with EIR? It is that we are a founding member of EIR. Uh, currently, we employ about 500 professionals, of which 35 in psychometrics. So being founded in 1968, all of the, let's say, the assessment expertise has been going into as in mainly one institute, and that makes us quite different from other institutes. So we are we look very much like ETS, but we, we're smaller. Uh, but everything in Europe, of course, is a little bit smaller than in the US, so that doesn't that doesn't matter to us. Um, the nice thing is that we can have a critical mass of let's say expertise around. And over here you see uh, the building that we uh, moved into in about seven years ago. Oh, I think the, it's going. Yeah, I'm watching the, the, the broadcast because I saw there was some desynchronization in the previous uh, show. So I tried to learn from that. I'm from Holland, so this is a kind of stereotype. 
we have to do a little bit of ent entertainment in between the sessions, of course. So we're the country of tulips, which you all love. I know you love in Thailand, but luckily it's too hot over here to grow them. <laughs> I know you try in Chiang Mai, but you still don't grow them large enough. So I think we have some benefit to that. Uh, like in Bangkok, we struggle with the water and we severely struggle with the water. Uh, we build dikes, um, we have huge uh, constructions uh, to keep the water out of, of, uh, of our country. Because half of our country is below sea level. People can't imagine what it is. If we don't do anything at all, half of our country will be a swamp. We love cheese, but I also know that in Thailand you love cheese. And this is called Bimster, which is uh, similar to Gouda, only even the taste is better than the Gouda one. Uh, we, we do have some traditional um, uh, uh, clothing, we have windmills, and of course all of the Dutch walk on, one, on wooden shoes. And we love, uh, let's say, raw fish, which is called herring. And on the right hand side you see also something from our, let's say, ancient arts, the, the Delft's blue, which is, I think, also familiar to you. Okay, enough for the advertisements. What are we doing at CITO? Basically, we have, uh, let's say, we address content, psychometrics, and the test delivery. For the content, we construct all kinds of educational measurements, including expertise for higher order thinking skills, 21st century skills, exams for secondary schools, and a range of other assessments, from early childhood to, let's say, student monitoring not only monitoring and assessing the children at the end of the education, but also during the education to help them to get the best out of themselves. We have a large psychometric um, department, and of course they do all kinds of psychometrical things. I was for, let's say, 25 years within the psychometric department and moved only recently to the international department. Um, we do all kinds of things. Calibration, we, we do item response modeling already for almost 30 years. So all of my professional life, I have been extremely lucky to be able to be in an environment that I could um, play around with uh, item response modeling. So we do equating. We also have advanced standard setting methods based on, on item response modeling. And let's say what is going to be more fashionable nowadays is all ATA, automatic test assembly, or computer adaptive, adaptive testing. And I also would like to share some of the, of the uh, developments that we have been going through over the last two decades in trying to make computer-based assessment. And uh, nowadays we use a, a platform which is called Questify for altering the items. We do that for item banking, for construction, and for the delivery of digital, but also for paper-based tests. So it's not only restricted to uh, digital tests. We do not only do that uh, in the Netherlands, but over here you see a kind of biased uh, map of the world. Uh, while being here, maybe it should be focusing on some different parts. But where you see the plectrums, we do have some interference with local governments, institutes that are in one way or another connected to educational assessment. This is also found, you can also find it on our website. So I would like to share a little bit uh, of you with two decades of uh, computer-based testing at CITO. And I'm very happy that Jan is uh, over here, Jan Vigas, who um, let's say, has done this kind of uh, presentation until a couple of years ago. So I'll pick up from there. And that's where you come in from the 2008, Moritz, you were saying 2008. Um, the right-hand panel that you see over here, you can see the big, uh, the big screens. That's about from 2008. Mm -hmm. um, but we started a little bit earlier. And I would like to address two parts, which are, in my opinion, are different. One, that a lot of institutes, and I think many of them belong to the audience and to the audience in this, the face-to-face -face audience, you have a challenge of getting from paper to computer-based. Some of the questions were addressed over there as well. And another challenge is that, suppose that you are allowed to start from scratch. What would you do on, on computer-based assessment? 
in my opinion, they are connected, but there are different challenges. Especially the first one, because you have an organization that is not really fit for purpose. You have an organization producing paper, and now you want to have that organization uh, produce a computer-based test. That's a huge challenge. What are, and I'm happy that uh, all of those have, that have been going uh, to speak before me have addressed this already, potential value adders of uh, computer-based testing. There's a huge benefit in logistics. And um, uh, one, of the, one of the benefits is security. We've been uh, uh, working together with, with uh, companies, with uh, institutes in Africa that have really tried to beat uh, what they call malpractice by delivering uh, by computer-based. If you have, some, you have a good example of a country in Nigeria where we have uh, worked with uh, the Joint Admission and Matriculation Board they administer 1.6 million candidates. There's a lot of Nigerians around. Um, and uh, getting paper-based tests to them takes sometimes a couple of days in a truck uh, supported by armed forces to deliver the test on the place. And you can imagine that you have there huge benefits from uh, uh, computer-based delivery. You have other threats again, but you replace them. You can control them. Um, you have the, the challenge of being online market, whether that is in, let's say, what I call an Anglo-Saxon Anglo system or direct marking from the computer, etc. You also have the benefits of technically enhanced items um, with, some, um, with some drawback, because you can also say it's not only the technology that should benefit, it should also be fit for purpose. Come back to that later. And you have the, the, the value of, of online adaptive testing, so you can adapt the test to the ability level of the person that you are testing. And whether that is for off learning or for for learning isn't really, uh, let's say, essential. It is that you have a technology that, that might uh, address that kind of problem. On the right hand side, you see a curve. Um, I took that from my colleague Mark Morena from um, uh, OIT, uh, Open Assessment Technologies. Um, this is uh, something like uh, uh, if you have new technology, everybody get gets excited. And then you get a, a peak of inflated uh, expectations. So over time, you get frustrated. You go through the, the, the valley of, um, of uh, thought, thought disillusionment. And then you go into the, let's say, a normal product of uh, uh, plateau of productivity. Uh, so this is a kind of thrill we all get through. We get excited, get disappointed, and then get to back to reality to create something that is feasible and uh, on which you can work. The benefits in logistics might be significant. Uh, I'm saying might because I come from a small country, so the logistic benefits in our country have not been that large, but as I was mentioning, for instance, our experience from Nigeria, but you would have, let's say, similar experience, could have similar experience in your countries. Um, Randy was already mentioning one of the benefits might be testing anywhere and anytime. But on the other hand, you know, in an Asian uh, context that might be threatening, uh, we already cope with one, one question, one test at one time, what are we going to do if we test anytime, anywhere? Uh, so we have to face certain challenges as well. So it has a, a, a benefit, but it might also, might also have a disbenefit. Um, easy response collection and more data. Well, I think in our next conference in September, we address the problem of uh, collecting big data. You can collect, but what's the use of collecting it? So it also addresses our assessment community to, to um, distract all the information that is necessary to measure and not just collect for the, for the sake of collection. You know these kind of cartoons, you know, get all the data we get and we will see what we can do with it later. We can have automatic scoring. That's a big uh, advantage. We can have online marking distributed in any way. Um, there are, uh, let's say, platforms, there are companies that um, specialize in uh, distributing different, different um, uh, what do you call it, uh, responses of students on essays to different markers, so you get a kind of sophisticated marking system. 
that works very well, better than let's say having it all on paper. And then is the question. It depends very much where you come from. You don't have to print paper, but you have to deliver in another way. So it's not only that you can have the reduced cost on the paper, but you get them from different kind of logistics. So I think that is a very local decision whether you benefit from it or not. <coughs> Going back to, let's say, you need some condition for digitation. You, you cannot have digital tests anywhere, 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 anyhow. There must be, let's say, it must be financially feasible. There were, there were a mentioning of cost. I think uh, producing um, digital tests are at a considerable cost. If you are compared to paper, you need a complete different infrastructure, it is more costly. So you can gain some in logistics, but it depends very much on uh, the local situation. It must be technical feasible. If I travel around in Africa and Asia and I see a lot of children just wandering about, not even go to school, and we talk about e-assessment, it's also a kind of disparity. So it must also be technical feasible. And to an extent, I'm very optimistic, because with technology becoming available, tablets, phones, we do get access to different, uh, let's say, technical uh, solutions of which we couldn't dream of before. Do remember how, let's say, um, how long we have the tablet. It's only a couple of years. And we think of it, it's been there for ages. And you know, if it took 10 years ago and we asked somebody, do you want to have a mobile phone? We say, well, what's the use of it? Now everybody is reading it, is, is using the, the, the phone. If we do some um, digital assessment to introduce, we need to include all stakeholders, including schools and teachers and students. We, get, we need to get them familiar with this kind of uh, uh, new mode of assessment, whether that is for assessment or of assessment. Randy was already uh, stressing the importance of going bit by bit, gaining experience, asking by questionnaires all of the stakeholders about the findings, get these findings, the results of these findings into a next cycle of the development. Um, and I'm, I was very happy that that question was raised already. We need to create sufficient added value for computer-based assessment. If it is not necessary, we shouldn't do it for the sake of doing it. We must realize if, you know, and there's a lot of just paper-based assessment, also in classroom assessment, that is extremely useful. So there must be sufficient value added before you introduce, really, the computer-based assessment. There must be an educational importance to it. If we now go back to our, let's say, 20 years of experience, we started going digital by using the computer for paper-based uh, exams, administering, administering them in a kind of environment, whether that be a kind of spreadsheet or a little database, getting into a more sophisticated um, administration of the test. And um, I think I, Randy can agree with me. We initially thought, okay, what we do is we make a kind of integrated system from the very beginning until the delivery of the test. And we try to program that. What can that be so difficult on doing that? Everybody is doing that. Um, but gradually, um, and that's, that's a sign that you get more of the, let's say, the, the software world, um, that integrated approach didn't work. You were, let's say, overhauled by new machines, by new techniques. So by the time you're ready, you were overhauled by different software programs, by different technical features or machines, etc. So what I witness is that there's more a kind of modular approach. But if you have a modular approach, you also have a call for standards because the different modules must be able to communicate with each other. So we have been engaged in developing standards for communication of different parts. And that brings me to the next step. And I've been, you know, with my colleague uh, Mark Molina uh, for uh, the, the 
the, the, the software company. I think there's also a split between a software expertise and an educational assessment expertise. I'm from an educational assessment institute providing educational assessment expertise, assessment expertise, and I want to add that to a software expertise. I'm not a software developer. I'm aware of the specification that I would like to, you know, for a software developer to develop uh, um, the computer-based testing. And uh, this is an example of, of CITO. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, we had, uh, uh, we had an integrated system, and gradually we got into a kind of modular approach in having a builder uh, to build the, the items, so it's an authoring system, then have a player, and disentangle the player from the builder. Initially we thought, okay, that's a good team, the player and the builder, and it still for some purposes is, but there are, let's say, different types of players available. And you shouldn't use, a, let's say, a player that is um, used, used to be used in heavy, high stakes environment for, for instance, low stakes environment. That can be distangled. So we have uh, the, the core still, the, the builder and the player, that can be separated. And I think right now at CITO we, uh, we use the, our builder uh, locally to support all of the processes to deliver, as I said, both the paper-based as well as the computer-based testing. And we have different players for the computer-based testing, depending on the purpose of the test. And to that you can add planners, administration, um, reporting, uh, rater modules, um, whatever is needed. And that, that depends on local use, what you need upon that kind of, let's say, system that you want to set up. And as I said, it needs, let's say, conversion tools, QTI, question and test interoperability, LTI, learning, learner, uh, uh, test interoperability, and we get to international standards. And there's committees, and I think they are worldwide, that there's a, a committee on standards, IMS standards, that, that, that emphasize the need and the development of these standards so that software developers can adhere to them so that they can build the different modules to work on the different environments. Now I'm going back. I'm a little bit at age, so I started off doing paper-based testing. And um, I think one of the key questions is, what is the quality of our test? And we have a relation between this test, the, the, the steps of test development and the standards. We have all kinds of standards from AERA, APA, NCME, whatever. So there are international standards that you test the quality of your test you would here. In Holland, we have a strict, even uh, a checklist, and that's called the COTAM, which is a committee for test for test uh, matters in Holland. They judge upon the quality of the test. So I'm going back to some basics. I'm going back to steps for effective test development, and they are from the Handbook of Test Development for Stephen Downing and Thomas Haladina. And this is the first chapter, worthwhile reading. And um, my, my allegation is that if you do develop a computer-based test, you also need to go through the different steps of development. Otherwise, we'll produce a test that is a nice test, and we forget the purpose of the test. So for any test, be that a paper-based test or a computer-based test, I think we have to go through an overall plan, we do the content definition, a test specification, we next go to item development, then we do a test design, an assembly of the test, then we produce the test, we administer the test, we can have another loop, whether that is a tryout or a, a pre-test, it's a loop. We do the scoring of the test responses, we, we establish passing scores, we report, on, we report on the results, the whole bunch of it should be administered or can be administered in item banking. Item banking to me not necessarily refers to an electronic item bank that has gone into it. But um, I'm still from the age that we have large cards on items. That's also an item bank. And so it's in the in the widest sense of the word. word. 
that we can do that more advanced, that's a good thing. And in the end, we need to account for what we have done in a test technical report. Now, if I move on to the, 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 the modular approach, it means that basic to me are the steps in the test development. They should be supported on two ways, by a platform and also by assessment expertise. So ass assessment expertise from, let's say, uh, an, uh, an exam body, uh, an, an institute for education assessment, and an assessment platform that should be done. It's an IT platform. It is a, a, a special profession. So from our point of view, we have started thinking that we could do it, and it become uh, not it becomes it becomes very um, it becomes a burden, so to speak. That means that we come to realize that we can add from our expect, uh, assessment expertise into, let's say, uh, an assessment platform, but you need professionals, IT, IT professionals, to do this kind of platforming. And I can stick to my uh, steps in the test development again. So, getting into a few more, a few less steps in, let's say, digital, and I put digital in between brackets because to me, you know, it's not referring to digital only. It can be paper-based as well. First of all, I develop, let's say, an overall plan. Well, if I go into digital, I call that the scope of my test. Then I go into item construction, test construction. I administer, register the candidates, delivery, do the scoring and reporting, do an analysis, and um, uh, go to see if I meet my scope again. And Yes, item banking is at the core of my action. I keep my constructed items in a, in, a, in a good way so that I can relate them to, different, to the different steps. And in the scope, I shouldn't forget that. Um, we need to get the target. We need to get the purpose. We need to identify the groups that it is meant for, and we need to get the level of security. And I'm telling you, this seems to be open door knowledge, and, and I'm also telling you, it isn't. We have to go back to step one all the, all the time. What's the purpose of the test? Do we address the right, the right group? Are we really meeting this kind of purpose, or, or is the test being used for some other purpose, and how can we cope with that? And also, what kind of, what level of security do we need? So all the time we have to keep these kind of questions in mind. You see the dots. This is a, a kind of exact, a, a, um, expanding list all the time. And we start with the basic requirements and add to that during time. If we go to the item construction, and that's uh, where uh, Randy also um, already um, said something. Compared to paper-based tests, we have a richer uh, environment from which we can choose from. But again, it must fit, be fit for purpose. We cannot just use it because it's nice to use. It must be useful to use. Uh, it must fit the purpose. That means that we get all kind of different types, and, and uh, you have seen some of them, and I will um, let's say show you a little bit more later on. One basic thing I've I've witnessed in my own environment is that if you go from paper-based to uh, digital testing, is that uh, people, if they're engaged in paper-based testing, they construct a test with items. If you go into something like digital testing, you must produce the items to build a task, test. That means that the requirements for metadata is much larger than in paper-based testing. If you have your item constructors, you have to re-educate them to, to, to make sure that they give you the metadata that you require for, uh, let's say, digital test taking. And the metadata are needed for something like automated test construction, but also for computer adaptive testing. And um, I'm telling you, that's not an easy task of doing that. So I have to re-educate people that are doing that task for early <coughs> years, and uh, they won't believe you initially. Once they get into, you know, uh, an environment where they have to produce uh, electronic or digital tests, they are 
convinced. And you just have to force them into getting the, meta the metadata. Um, this is an unreadable sheet. And I think, I hope that the source is readable. I'm not too sure whether it, the broadcast is as I see. And uh, again, this is a kind of um, taxonomy of item types. Going from, let's say, the least uh, complex, most constrained on the left hand side, top, a multiple choice, true, false, into something like a diagnostic <coughs> testing item on the right hand side. Um, we could go, we go, could go through, let's say, explaining you from all of the types uh, uh, and giving you some examples. I've decided, in view of time, uh, not to do so, so I skipped all of them, leaving some of the nicer bits in the end. So this is a, a, a source which is published, and uh, you, you will get access to the sheet so you can uh, get to the, to the source. If we go to the test development cycle, I want to um, to go to the to the next step. That you know, after you have constructed the items, to the test construction, to tell you something a bit more about that. You have different ways of assembling the test. It can be linear, random, adaptive. Uh, one of the things that is very popular right now, I think, in view of uh, control, is multi-stage testing. I don't know whether you are using that or you've heard about that. Um, for all of them, you need a um, test blueprint, all of the specifications. And that's where you have that you know, important part from the purpose of the test. Because from the purpose of the test, you direct your specifications. And so for the test construction, I need to fulfill all my um, uh, specifications. And nowadays, if, if I have a good specification, if I have my metadata at order, I can try to, to ask the expert to fit to fit uh, uh, all of the requirements into the computer to get the test delivered. But I also want, let's say, that to be automatically done from an item bank. Doing that from an item bank <coughs> is not too easy, as I said, especially if you go from paper-based to computer-based, you need to re-educate your constructors to give you a lot of information about uh, the, the items. In optimization, uh, you need um, uh, decision variables, constraints, and an objective function. Um, I can't go also because of time too much in detail, but you will find uh, on different sources. Um, you need to get which items can be selected. Which requirements do you fulfill in automatic test assembly? And what are your preferences? Our experience, my experience is that you need specifications, specifications, specifications from your item developers to make sure that you deliver the right test. If you think about the constraints, you can think about the type, the test length, the item use, the graphics, depending on which play you have, you have constraints on that one. Um, you can think about psychometric constraints. Uh, do you have enough uh, data to get the difficulty of the item? Um, you need to fill certain reliability requirements, depending on the purpose of your test, uh, whether it's high stake or low stakes. Um, it's also expressed in measurement uh, precision. Um, there were some questions before this uh, seminar. Um, Time is too short to go into, let's say, technical details. You need also uh, content, domains, uh, test blueprints, ready. And at item level, you also need the kind of the social structure of your item bank. Uh, who are friends, items that belong together, for instance, in the text, items together, also enemy sets. If you ask twice the same, or if you give the answer away from one, one item to another, that should be excluded. So all that kind of stuff you need to administer well before you start automatic test assembly. In the Netherlands, we have uh, that automatic test assembly at place in our central examinations, uh, but also, for instance, in the theoretical exams for driver's license. Uh, I understand 
that uh, it's more difficult to, to get a driver's license in Holland than in Thailand. So in, Ho in Holland we have to do, first of all, a theoretical exam, and you have to pass that, with, uh, uh, and the pass, rate is the pass rate is very high. You, you need to get uh, a lot of, I shouldn't say the pass rate, but the, um, you need to get a lot of questions correct before you pass. Um, and then you have to do a practical exam, but it's quite a thing to do the, the, the theoretical exam, exam. So nowadays we put automatic test assembly in place to get parallel um, theoretical exams. We do also um, Dutch as a second language, that's one of the exams that can be passed anywhere, anytime, and you need parallel sessions. Uh, we also apply it in, in, uh, in our project in Kazakhstan, where we select, uh, where, we, where we support Nazarbayev intellectual schools in their selection test, and we need parallel versions of the, of the selection test to make sure that we have the same demand, the same uh, test, the equivalent test, over time. But we also um, do uh, automatic test assembly in projects that we run in, uh, in, in Switzerland and in Italy. In Italy for Invalsi uh, uh, to produce, um, uh, let's say, equivalent tests uh, for different uh, purposes over there. Going back to our test uh, cycle, analysis and evaluation, um, of course, we do classical test theory where, where possible, because it's easy, and even if you have a lot of different tests available, then the, the, the basic characteristics developed from classical test theory are very usual, very, very useful to interpret. And as I said, we have a long tradition in using item response modeling, so I thought, okay, that, that's, that's known, that could be known to you, but what's new? Uh, recently, and that for the Switzerland project, we we have developed an online calibration of digital tests, and that's something which is very interesting to me, because um, normally in using you know, comp in, in combining different and co getting computer-based tests, you need item characteristics in advance before you can assemble the test. But suppose that you could just calibrate online, wouldn't that be a challenging uh, thing? And um, Let's say, and this is a little bit beyond my time now, I've been, you know, working on test test theory, item response modeling for a long time, and now my colleagues get into R. You know, I've tried to learn R as well. It's, it's embraced by uh, a lot of scientists because it's open source. And I think, I, I, I admire the, the, say, the open source idea, because I think the, the, the challenges that we face are too much to be solved by one institute or one person. So it's something that we should share. And um, so we have developed, uh, based on our, let's say, um, experience and, and expertise in classical test theory and item response modeling, a, a package, an R package that is open source and can be downloaded. And that package runs on data sets that can be provided by uh, change by 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 uh, let's say a computer-based testing change chain because there's sometimes a misunderstanding of having a computer-based test and then you know the automatic scoring the automatic scoring is not automatic you have to program that all the way around uh, and that makes it very difficult sometimes much more inflexible than uh, reading uh, um, uh, a response from a from a paper. So going back to that, that, that computer-based, so that is within the computer adapted testing, and that's, um, that's a long story. The, the joint um, uh, uh, maximum likelihood is not embraced by the psychometric society because that creates estimates that are, that are inconsistent and um, have a bias. But we discovered how we can, let's say, cope with that. Uh, and we combine, uh, let's say, um, that um, uh, to develop a CAT with uh, some of the items measured properly and, and measured um, and, and, and analyzed properly with item response modeling. And that as a feed for, let's say, online calibration. So once you give a student some of the items that are known, that have known properties with some unknown properties, we are able to estimate the, the, the psychometric characteristics of those items that feed into that computer-based test. 
it's at, at this, um, let's say, initial stages in, uh, in, in, um, in, in a project in Switzerland. So we hope to be happy in reporting on that uh, on different conferences. So keep track. I think it's promising because if we if we are able to do this, that solves a lot of problem in problems in getting computer-based tests uh, up and running. Going back to that um, uh, R package, which is baptized Dexter, uh, uh, it has a comprehensive system for management and analysis of test data. It, it runs on different um, uh, operating systems. Um, it runs from different scoring rules. It can be used in uh, the formats that are known to R. Um, and it has a large array of classical indices as well as uh, different uh, item response modeling um, characteristics. And it, it is amongst projects that are added to the R library. Uh, you can find it uh, in the cramrproject.org. Uh, library. I have a few more minutes left, is it, uh, Moritz? Um, or, uh, we can add something like 45 minutes, is that in order? Yeah, but, but that would be with the questions as well. Eh? So we have, uh, well, I will continue now. Is it okay? To be honest, we've got sufficient time. Yeah. Uh, I just want to share some recent, recent developments at CETO. Uh, one is on uh, diagnostic test on secondary school for 15 year old and another one is on monitoring progress in primary school. And I'm, I'm sure that some of the questions that you have raised or thoughts that have been be, be, uh, coming up to you because of the questions were raised um, are now being answered in, in the, the type of things that I may show to you. Um, the experience on a diagnostic test for secondary school for 15 year old and that's a, a Dutch government initiative uh, contracted to uh, well uh, contracted to the foundation and it, it, it is about um, Dutch English and mathematics so it you can ima imagine that's about the PISA age eh? 15 year old and the challenge was to provide a reliable a diagnosis on all aspects of the student skills and test at a reasonable length and reliable diagnosis and reasonable length are of course the challenges that you should that we are facing and this is one where we are, were allowed to start off a, a digital test from scratch and one of the nice thing is that and going back to let's say my steps of development because that's something we we often forget is that what are we measuring? What, we, what do we intend to measure? So we used an evidence-centered design approach um, being advocated already since 1999, Randy, is it? Ms. Levy. Two decades ago they started saying that it is important to get a fundament under our, let's say, purpose of the test. Um, so we can, we have started again using evidence-centered design to define a student model that allows us also to use new item types because they were different from the item types that we are used to. So if we are catched up in the process of getting from paper into digital, it's different than we say, okay, now you can start from scratch. And it also uses elements of uh, computer adaptive testing, the Responses are scored automatically, and there's also some advanced scoring. So you can also, as a as a developer, introduce different types of scoring. Now I must see if uh, I can do something. This is very. This is one of the questions. It's difficult. It's in Dutch. So don't don't make an attempt to read until you uh, unless you're Dutch, Maurice. Yeah. You can read it. <laughs> It's just the idea of getting you to know. This is something, an, an, a use of an equation editor within the question. Okay, so there's some question about a linear equation uh, and a student has to do something. Now this is simulating the, no, you have to go back. Sorry. Good. Put my hand and see if it works. This is a little movie behind that. That makes it difficult. But you see that the equation editor that is relevant for this exercise is appearing. 
and the student can do something sensible with it. Or, or something which is, doesn't make sense, but it's being judged, it's being rated anyhow. So this, this response is then, um, let's say, evaluated automatically. So you're always at, at hand. And of course, this has a meaning. This has to fit a certain purpose within mathematics. I'm giving you just one of the examples. Okay? No, it's going again. Sorry. <laughs> I can stop this, huh? We make a good team, uh, uh, Randy. <coughs> the next one is that, can you imagine that if you read something or if you write something, so within this whole exercise of evidence-centered design, one of, the, one of the features was if you have a text and you can divide it into paragraphs that are of interest, so highlighting the different, let's say, aspects of a text is one of the features to be able to understand the text. So this is the reciprocal, it's, it's the other way around. So one of the questions would be, can you divide a, a, a lump of text into relevant paragraphs? And this is the way it can be done. And again, the scoring machine behind this is evaluating this. You can also do some, if you haven't done that. Who's this one? Mm -hmm. The next one would be, you can imagine if you have a text and there are grammat grammatical errors of, or errors in the text itself, and you can ask the student to spot them, to highlight them, and you can evaluate them. I must be careful to put my hand upon this little hand in the presentation. And you can see that in this case, you can highlight the, the text where there's an error to be evaluated automatically as well. And this one is a little bit more advanced. It says, detect the wrongly spelled items and correct them. So you see that it's a bit more uh, advanced, but also related to, let's say, something you really want to know from the person. So it's based on, let's say, a theoretical model, a student model that is behind the development of these kind of items. Um, it's a nice one. I, I, I think um, what can be done is nice. Um, this is about... Um, uh, yeah, a mathematical exercise just to give you an impression. There are two trees. There's a, there's a, um, what do you call it? Something that that birds gets afraid of is in the field, and uh, this is, a, is something a map that is left over to a to a uh, a boy uh, of this age, and he finds to get a treasure, which is on the, the in the in the middle of the circle that um, that has the the two trees. And the the, uh, the bird, um, I call it Frightener, uh, and the circle. So I just give it, you no. Know. So this is all done, and you can see that if, if you have this kind of idea, you can do it in a different way. So it's um, it's constructing uh, the middle of the circle that should. Uh, take care that all of the points are on the um, uh, circumference of the circle. So the different tools are, are developed. And um, 
I, I think myself is a bit maybe exaggerated, but it's indicating that we can move on in evaluating also the process of, of doing it. Now, this is done correctly. So the, the nice thing is that if you go live, what, what is a student doing? And it's all recorded as well, as Wendy already explained, leading to some, uh, let's say, conclusion about the abilities of the student. Yes, uh, about uh, the response processing, important. This is uh, uh, an, a nice item too. Um, it, it has, um, let's say, the, uh, to find out the, the, the area um, by formula of A and B for the rectangular, which is um, uh, in, in this uh, presentation, based on the shape of the triangular that forms the basis of, uh, of this um, uh, square. And obviously, I challenge you, you can do it immediately or I can leave it a little bit, but that, uh, the circle, the, the the, the area is uh, a square plus b square. Uh, you can do that smartly, but you can also do it a little bit more uh, in a different way, or even others. All of them are, let's say, indicating maybe not the correct answer, but they would lead to the correct answer if you would simplify the formulas. So does it mean that the student has gone it wrongly or whatever, you can detect maybe from the different types of answers that you allow also um, some of the, I call it, some components of the ability of a student. Yeah? So you can judge all of the different and evaluate all of the different responses. I admit, maybe it's just the beginning. We have a beginning that can, can do it. And uh, the, 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 um, the little panel that you have on the right hand side below uh, gives you to, uh, um, access to evaluate the different types of, let's say, responses that you have. Uh, so whether it is better or equal or uh, approximately equal, it depends a little bit on the purpose of your test. So you have an, you have an interaction with the scoring of the different responses. Um, remember that this, this was about a diagnostic test, uh, so it's not uh, uh, the, the score which is important, the score is important too, but you need to, to assemble and collect data along the road, along the process, that can uh, give you some insight about the abilities of the, diff of the students. So you can add uh, coding information along the processes and you can relate possible responses to one or more aspects of the of the skill model. As you start off with a with a student model exactly explaining what do you want to measure from a student getting the items uh, together. And the delivery is a response uh, producing during the test it generates diagnostic data because you have, let's say, student-wise collected data and you use adaptive uh, algorithms in between to get, uh, uh, the, let's say, to the next uh, assignment of the student depending on their uh, responses so far. And just to give you a, a little bit of insight, um, normally you would be interested in the raw score. Is the, is the answer correct or not? But this is also about, let's say, disentangling the process of the scoring. So you would collect all kind of information during the, the, the say, the test taking. The reporting is based on a, on a different uh, psychometric modeling Bayesian uh, network, also leading to probability in the end, whether a student is on level, below level, or above level. Never been sure, but as a highest prob probability. This is just giving you some insight. So this is what we call uh, advanced uh, computer-based testing. Item types that collect more data than just a single delivery. Uh, adding advanced scoring for diagnostic testing. 
using adaptive testing. In the end, it should it could to lead to reduced testing time and authentic testing experience. And I want to use one more minute or it's for a very nice application that I uh, myself like very much. Um, it's celebrating educational progress. Testing not as a test, but as a kind of challenge to uh, individuals. <coughs> what is interesting in formative assessment is to find out where is the person right now, where are you going to, and how can you get the learner to go there. And um, of course, this presentation could be more elaborate. We have limited time. And we have developed at CITO a kind of uh, prototype, which is being embraced by uh, students in schools right now. So the experience is very, very nice, very encouraging. And um, it departs from, again, don't try to read because it's Dutch. But you can read the, the bullets. They are green, they are crossed, and you see little pictures on top, I hope. Yeah? So on the, what you can call the, the X axis, there are different students. All of them are different. And on the left hand side, you see all, with all this text, you see learning objectives. Learning objectives formulated in two ways. One, teacher, to be understood by a teacher, and another learning objective to be understand, to be understood by the learner. Yeah? And this is the control panel from the teacher, on which you can see that, let's say, the which learning objectives have been assigned to the individual learner. The green bullet means that the learner has made some of some items. Each learning objective is measured by about seven items, so it's very briefly done. It's a kind of challenge. You do the exercise. All of them should be done, could be done by the by the by the learner if the learning objective is uh, understood by them. So the, the teacher is in control, he assigns learning objectives to each individual learner. If the items that are behind the learning objectives are correctly done, you get a green bullet, otherwise you get a, 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 an orange bullet. The teacher can also overrule the uh, different uh, assignment, uh, the different results, because Sometimes, maybe students have gone out of track, whatever. So you can interact with the students to see whether the, the, uh, the, the progress has been made or whether the students should redo the exercises on this typical um, learning objective. Yeah, and in this way, you can also see the, the, the different uh, progress for the different students. This is the student panel where you have the uh, uh, kind of symbolization of the different areas. Uh, in this case, it's mathematics, uh, numbers, uh, graphics, etc. with uh, the, the assign assignment to the different uh, learners. So this is an individual panel for each student is different. Uh, on top, this is the type of items they get. So they're kind of conventional items, so not, not uh, they love them. The reaction is, okay, this doesn't feel like a test from students. And this is the kind of results are below. So you get assigned, and if you get it, that you put them into your portfolio. So you, you're stacking your different, um, um, let's say, assignments. Uh, there's a little bit of feedback. Uh, if a student gets a wrong answer, you get uh, the correct answer for feedback with some uh, explanation. Yeah, now to conclude, computer-based exams is a demand, a new way of working. I've been stressing it before, uh, making the exams. Uh, we had to reorganize our uh, structures, organizing the exams, the exam board, the schools, preparing for exams, and uh, it takes years. It doesn't take overnight. So even if we are ready, those who assess and those who are involved in the assessment are not yet, and you have to take them along. Well, it's one of my
Slogans. Never forget the purpose. Go back. It can be a nice item, but does it suit to the purpose? Do your research. Apply lessons learned. And don't apply lessons learned by others, but learn by yourself. Gather evidence. I think we get into a kind of community to use open standards, embrace them, add, and see if we can um, work together. Collaborate and implement. For me, it's about time for a beer. <laughs> I know it's not your brand, but you will forgive me that this, this one is taken in Vietnam. Um, but it could have been here. Um, enjoying the world, enjoying food, enjoying company. Thank you very much. Well, no, no beer yet. We're first going to take a few questions. And then we'll see whether we've got a beer in stock for you, uh, friends. Yeah. Um, if we circulate with the microphone once more, is there any question from anybody uh, in this room? I would like to know something. I see not everybody at the same time, please. It's great. By the way, um, uh, we have got a, a great expert among our midst, and this expert is now going to ask a question. Uh, Esther, would you like to say also a little bit about yourself? Before sure. I sure, thank you. So my name is Esther Kerr, I'm from the Brookings Institution. Uh, I've been doing a uh, lot of work here in Southeast Asia, in particular in uh, the Philippines for the last few years around their um, education and assessment reform. I've also been involved in uh, what we call the Assessment and Teaching of 21st Century Schools project before then, which was around trying to put dynamic assessment around collaborative problem solving and ICT digital literacy. Up on, um, on computer based um, and online testing. Um, however, the question I have is a very simple one. Um, uh, so, France, I, I really liked looking at some of those new item types you had. And I've just got a very, very basic question. When uh, you did the text one of um, uh, identifying that there was something wrong with the text, was that around the grammar or was that around the logical reasoning within the text, within the paragraph? In this case, it was about the spelling of the word. No, no, it was before the spelling. You said there was something wrong with like a clause. Yeah, if, if so, if the if the um, if there's something wrong in the sentence, so double or inconsistent, so uh, not logic, something like that. Oh, right. Yeah. I mean, because it it I mean, the whole idea of that is really quite fascinating because you can look at logical reasoning or critical yeah, thinking within yeah, it. Yeah. So the, the actual technique itself, yeah. you could obviously apply to lots of different um, subdomains. Correct, yeah. correct. Thanks yeah. very much for the question. Yeah. That is very interesting. Um, in this moment, no questions from Skype seem to be coming through. I, I'm going to, to, to abuse the fact that I'm sitting here to also ask you a question, uh, Franz, and uh, in a way uh, benefiting from uh, Esther's uh, presence here. Uh, know that you're an expert in uh, assessment of uh, 21st century uh, skills. Um, when we think about 21st century skills, at least as it was conceptualized at the time by the OECD, it united things of uh, around information skills, uh, communication skills, but also uh, social ethical commitments, I think that uh, they called it at the time. And I was just wondering, is there something and maybe this is a question to, to both of you, Randy and, and Franz. Is there something about computer-based testing that makes this more apt to uh, assessing a certain skill set uh, that is around moral skills or moral literacy or social-emotional learning, etc.? Uh, for example, uh, as, as conceptualized at the time by Lawrence Kohlberg, I don't know whether that's from before the time of the persons who are sitting around the table, but is there something about computer-based testing that makes this more uh, apt for assessing uh, moral literacy, social ethical compromise, social emotional learning than pen and paper-based testing? Maybe, uh, Randy, I've been talking such a long time. It's up to you <laughs> to give it. Uh, give it. I, will, I will join in. I guess, guess the only uh, thing that jumps out at me is if there are aspects of socio-emotional learning that you conceptualize it assessing in an adaptive way. Uh, so if you can imagine 
uh, having a socio-emotional learning scale uh, whereby, depending upon a student's response to an item, you then present a different item than you would have presented had the student given a different response. So in that sense, that's, that's one instance. Uh, another instance is uh, situational judgment. So you can imagine presenting students with uh, scenarios, uh, perhaps video scenarios, and uh, ask questions about the video scenario. Uh, so present a situation in which someone behaves uh, in a social situation in a particular way, and the question to the student relates to uh, how would you react? And uh, what you're trying to get at is uh, that student's socio-emotional skill in dealing with the social situation. Thank you, Francis. Like yeah, yeah. I can, I can add from my experience, and I, I, I think Randy can join in as well. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, and my experience is that I've been through, you know, in this business for quite some time. Um, that we tend to measure, let's say, what we can call basic skills first, in the sense of uh, maybe language and mathematics. Yeah, that's that's normally done. So if you get into something innovative. And we see we see a repetition. Uh, it's not only now, but it's a repetition. Going into uh, computer-based testing, the first thing we try to computerize is language testing and mathematics, science. And um, and that's why I'm I'm happy with your response, Esther. That let's say we should and 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 adding to that 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 open source and discussion is necessary to get uh, creative thinking about. Uh, let's say use of, of um, let's say assessment methodology for different types of assessment than let's say the conventional uh, 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 let's say call it basic skills and, and nevertheless these basic skills should be assessed or can be assessed as well whether that is for or of learning but um, let's say to use that as a basis to develop uh, let's say assessments that have a different nature okay uh, there's, there's many things that haven't been touched upon yet. We haven't talked about gaming yet. There's many other things that, that can be uh, uh, mentioned. Is there anything else from those present here that you would like to raise? And I see that there's questions from Schein. No, it's a question from me. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, Even better. Two questions, I think. Questions. The first question is out of curiosity. I think to France. Um, how, how comfortable are those wooden shoes that still wear? Um, yeah. Thank you very much for the, for your question. I, I will just refer to Jan. I have a pair which for which I do the gardening. Uh, they are safety boots and they are hard to wear. Um, I can also I haven't shown you that, but if we go to Africa, then uh, we always have a kind of um, uh, social evening where we have to uh, well, not where, where we are happy to appear on an evening on, this, an, on a cultural event. That means that every country, every peasant company, co uh, country, uh, performs something. And we always use, uh, let's say, clogs and that as well, the wooden shoes. And we have uh, the soft version, you know, that's the nicest part. So we have two different options. But if you're interested, maybe I will bring you the soft ones for, uh, for wearing. Although, although uh, Bangkok would be too hot to wear them. <laughs> You mentioned in your presentation about the approach of the Kazakhstan for Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools. Uh, just wondering why you chose Kazakhstan. I mean, you're interested in Kazakhstan because it's it's in the, the region we are covering in the Bank of the Town. Mm -hmm. So why you chose Kazakhstan and when did this project start? And why also uh, chosen those schools, the Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools? Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, as a matter of fact, we didn't choose Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan chose us. Um, uh, and uh, I got aware of that, that that's where we, where, to me, West and East meet, because you, you are covering Kazakhstan, and we are there, out there as well. We've been there since uh, 2010, uh, so they got to know about uh, our assessment expertise, and we have been sharing that with them in different projects. Uh, not only uh, our institute has been there, but also uh, Cambridge Assessment has been there. Uh, for the for the curriculum part, so it's a it's a joint uh, effort of different uh, institutes that are let's say um, 
available uh, in, in the world to share this kind of expertise. And the type of projects, so this is, let's say, for selection tests, so they have uh, a number of schools that are kind of example schools, uh, secondary schools, so they have to select uh, the brightest students in there to get the correct students in. And um, we also have a, run a project over there to monitor that progress all the time in language and in mathematics. And I would be happy to learn about, let's say, UNESCO's involvement in, in Kazakhstan. That's one of the aims, of course, of the, the network that we are, um, let's say, um, uh, attending. Yeah. Well, we're very glad, very glad that you would like to know more about it because we are planning to work there. So uh, who knows? Um, it's a great opportunity to speak to uh, two of the uh, world's leading experts in uh, computer-based assessment. And great opportunity to ask them basically anything you would like to relate to this topic. Of course, sir. <coughs> Dan, could we get the microphone to the stand? Okay. Okay. Hello, thank you very much for the interesting presentations. Uh, my name is Bali, and I'm from Azerbaijan, just arrived from the airport, so I apologize for the being late. Um, my question is so, when we're talking about computer um, adaptive testing, we have this first level um, in algorithm, a couple of items depending on the, how we decide. And because of that, the first um, uh, level of items we face an issue of uh, art exposure. So thinking of that challenge in a computer adaptive testing, and then going back to the presentation where you mentioned the crowdsourcing, the, the platform for online um, uh, calibration. So is there a threat, because your user also referenced items there, where you have psychometric properties there as well, making it public. So is the threat the same? Um, the one that we, we refer in the item exposure when you're trying to, to, to calibrate the new items online. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, item exposure is always a problem, uh, but you can control for that to a, to a large extent. And um, so, in, in, in online calibration, it means that you have uh, the, the, the item exposure might be less because you add on new items. So to that extent, it has an advantage. Um, but of course, uh, you have to you have to uh, uh, to, to do something about uh, the, the the exposure, and that's always a threat. And when I mean sharing, it, it always means um, sharing the technology, not sharing the items. So the items are very much related to the purpose of the test, and I consider that to be you know the the one that are in charge of that test. It's very it's very uh, difficult to. Um, to just export a complete test uh, for, let's say, a local purpose that is not the purpose that is originally designed for. Uh, I want to warn for that, that 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 has a no goal with us. It, it doesn't work. So you have to redo the designing, the purpose, and sometimes they might fit in, but don't take them just like that. So would you um, calibrate the new items and then use those items for the, the new sets of new items? Well, yeah. Uh, technically, it works like, uh, let's say, the, 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 the based on a small pool of which you know the characteristics. So it's still conventional CAT or conventional uh, automatic assembly. But uh, the nice thing about this using online is that you restrict it by using a, a, a subset that, of which you know the properties. That uh, makes makes the, 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 the calibration, the online calibration of new items into the set uh, possible. So the item exposure problem comes about uh, in cases where the test is a high stakes one, so you care about the security, and in cases where you're doing uh, adaptive testing because you're going to reuse the items. Uh, in paper testing, in some countries, you'll create a test form, you'll administer it, you'll use it for the high stakes purposes you're using it for, you'll never use those items again. You'll create a new form next year. In computerized adaptive testing, you create a set of items, 
and you're using them over and over again. You're creating for each student a different test form by selecting items from the item bank. The larger the bank, the less you have an exposure problem as long as the items in the bank are distributed well over the levels of difficulty uh, for which students are being assessed. And to the extent, uh, as Franz says, that you're bringing new items into that pool and taking items out of that pool as they get exposed. So there's a rotation occurring. Quick uh, question again to the board. You, uh, gender effects. Sometimes you're anecdotally that boys feel more comfortable with taking computer-based tests than girls. Would you uh, validate that, or is that not based on any evidence? Um, there certainly might be. Um, in our uh, way of working and experience, we always, um, as I try to locate uh, this, whether that is uh, genitive or minority or whatever. So if there's a threat of, uh, of the test being not suitable for any subgroup, you try to, to do some research to make sure that, that the test is. Uh, that, that sounds like an open door <laughs> solution, but uh, 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 let's say diff research sometimes is um, let's say a costly research it takes a lot of a lot of time and it should be in vain because if you find something you have a problem. So that's why I'm a little bit reluctant in, in saying this, but this is what we do. So about the quality of the test, you need to take measures that you can show that this test is uh, let's say, resistant to that kind of gender difference or whatever. So is it just briefly interrupt, uh, there's like diff for the test, but are you also checking whether there's additional diff uh, for the medium of testing for computer-based test versus paper-based? Paper -based? Yeah. Um, you, that, that is only valid if, if you have uh, the situation where you want to compare the two of them. Uh, so you have a, another open door maybe, but um, so if, if so, yes, we do. Uh, if not, so we, you can see that, um, that, that, and it depends very much on the type of test. That there's also something like, okay, uh, girls can do better on, uh, on, on of, you know, have, have a, is favorable for language testing and boys for mathematics, but things turn out sometimes the other way around. Uh, the, the basic is, and I, I did in one of my last sheets, is do your research, and that is related to the purpose of the test. And of course, one of the quality of the test is that it, that it, that you do this kind of research. Absolutely. Sir, please. Thank you. I think I'm going to have two questions. The first, uh, the first one is about how to uh, construct the test items. Um, specifically, do you use automatic item generation for creating the item bank? The second question is about the diagnostic testing. Um, since we know that uh, for, for for the last scale test, usually we don't we don't have enough space for like, many many items in the test form uh, or test booklet. How can we construct and include enough? Number of items for diagnostic purposes. Thank you. And, and sort of what you want saying who you are and, and where you work. Uh, my name is Tom Yuki Tumapan. I'm from the National Institute of Educational Testing Service of Taiwan. It's like similar to BTS. Um. First, your question about automatic item uh, uh, generation. Um, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we started with that. That didn't bear so much field. So currently, we do not do it. Uh, but there certainly is a kind of feature. And I think with um, art artificial intelligence, there's certainly possibilities. But you know, that's why I'm telling the CETA story. Uh, to my knowledge, 
we don't do do that. We we wish to do that, and maybe you know to uh, to a small extent. Mm. For instance, in the, the last example I showed you for primary education, we we do uh, because but then then it's not automatically. But what we we because you need a lot of different um, uh, formats. It's easy. I mean, you you change. It depends a little. It depends very much on the purpose. Like this is a kind of formative test. Uh, uh, very dedicated to some something like learning objectives, very close. And then it's easy to manip to to not to manipulate, but to generate different types if you have a format. Uh, just also for the student to have different different challenges, and that's also suited to that purpose. For high stakes, of course, I think it's it's much more elaborate and and much more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and then about uh, the digital testing, well, I think uh, and I hope that's been clear from from my from the presentation that. In developing digital uh, tests for for diagnostic testing, sorry, uh, it's also the diagnostic testing. Yeah, um, you can have a wealth of information from one type. It's a, it's a different source. You you develop the items completely different from you used to do from paper-based testing, and that is the key to you know uh, uh, multi-purpose source. So for each student, they will appear different. Because they are highly adapted to measuring that candidate on the different aspects that you are interested in, to give a diagnosis that is highly adapted to the to the need of that candidate. So yes, you need, but this is also, I mean, this is a costly project. Any 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 anything to do with uh, computer-based testing does cost a lot of money, and if you have this technically advanced uh, advanced items, they do cost a lot of money. So yes. Then you need also uh, a lot of different items. You only can hope and make them kind of time resistant. Uh, that's also one of the requirements you can do that you can have them survive because, let's say, security and um, uh, being exposed means exposed to this uh, cohort of students. Yeah? This cohort of students is not interesting. Uh, about let's say the knowledge of or the testing of the students that come next year or the year thereafter. So sometimes you can keep uh, some of the items secured for the cohort that is going to be assessed. That also needs need, needs a smart design. We have examples from that in Holland too. So we put them in what we call in the fridge for one or two years, and if they then are cool enough, you put them in again. Would you like to add something? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I would add that uh, the best way to have a diagnostic assessment is either to have an assessment that is focused on a very narrow skill, and that way you can have uh, sufficient questions about that skill, or uh, a very long test. And uh, it's very hard to do diagnosis unless you have enough information uh, about what it is you're trying to diagnose. Great, thanks a lot to the uh, colleague from Thailand for these uh, very uh, interesting questions. We've got five more minutes. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to use this opportunity uh, to ask uh, something? We don't need to sit here five more minutes in case there isn't, but uh, given the fact that we've got some really interesting critical mass around the table, and, and don't feel that any question is off limits as long as it's within the topic. If you feel that you're critical of computer-based testing, that's also absolutely fine. Uh, yeah. Esther. I just think some, some comments um, about this particular topic that I'm going to mention might be useful. Um, in our work around uh, assessment of skills, the thing that's been very much on my mind is that when we're talking about skills education, I'm talking about generalizable skills, generic skills, critical thinking, communication, whatever. When we think about those, we're interested primarily in students learning how to engage in those practices, in those skills. We're interested in the process. We're not so much interested in the outputs. So if we think about traditional education, we've been interested in whether the students acquire knowledge, whether they can retrieve that knowledge on demand, and whether they can push it back out to them. 
But now that many education systems are thinking much more about helping their students develop these other sorts of skills, we're interested in the process. So when we think about knowledge, in many ways that's static. You know, you have a fact. What is the answer to that fact? And in assessment, that's relatively, relatively easy to assess because it's a known, it's a constant. When we're talking about the skills that are now interested in processes, we're interested a lot more in dynamics. And so the major question for us is the degree to which computer-based assessment, as well as assessment in the classroom, can capture that much more dynamic sort of skills. So I, I just wonder if you'd like to talk about that. Well, one interesting question, and I think ongoing debate, uh, is whether it makes more sense uh, to assess things like communication and uh, collaboration and critical thinking in particular uh, as general skills or within the context of uh, specific domains. Uh, under the or following the argument that the nature of those skills uh, changes uh, in some important ways uh, from one domain to the next. Uh, critical thinking is not the same in science as it is in art history, uh, as it is in mathematics, as it is in the English language arts. There are uh, undoubtedly some aspects of critical thinking that carry over across uh, those domains, but there are also very important differences. The nature of uh, knowing is different from uh, one domain to the next. Uh, so it may be the case that it's sensible to think about the assessment of those skills in uh, two forms, one within domain and one uh, at the more general level across domain. In uh, cognitive sciences, uh, it's generally it's recognized that uh, general skills are broadly useful, but they're also very weak. They don't get you very far in solving problems that require a lot of domain-based knowledge. Domain-based knowledge, on the other hand, is very powerful, but it's very brittle. That is, once you get outside the boundaries of the domain, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, especially if you're in a domain that has very different ways of knowing, uh, or very different uh, rules for what constitutes evidence, for what constitutes uh, the way in which one goes about uh, uh, traversing uh, and uh, uh, behaving within that domain. So uh, I th those are my thoughts about uh, the kinds of uh, skills you're asking about. Uh, say more about the dynamic nature that you are talking about, so I can think more about that, if you would. I, I think there's two parts to what I'm, two parts to what I'm talking about. One is, one is referring to dynamic just in the sense of, of processes, where it just doesn't have to think about. Yeah. The other way you could interpret what I said before, though, is the concept of dynamic testing, so you know, in terms of online testing. Um, so we're aware now that computer-based, or at least online testing, provides us with the facility for a dynamic environment, you know, based mm -hmm. on the student's response to an item, that item itself can change. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, behind the scenes, we can capture a great deal of information about what the decision is basically that a student is making by virtue of the actual uh, explicit responses of that student, as well as by the nature of how the student navigates around a page of the website and so on. So I think there are two ways that you could take that question, and either is equally. Yeah, yeah. equally yeah, so both things are true, I think. Uh, one can uh, record 
the process the student is using, and it could be in the context of a collaborative problem, which two students are working, and the collaboration itself is being uh, recorded and then analyzed uh, with inferences drawn about the quality of the collaboration and the extent to which the collaboration resulted in something of meaning. Uh, perhaps in solving a problem that uh, the pair or uh, maybe group was given to solve. Uh, but further, to your second meaning, uh, it could be the case that uh, in the design of your assessment, you decide to give a different problem based on the results or the process that uh, you observed the students using in uh, the first problem. So I think both of those things could happen in a computer-based environment in ways that they could not easily happen in a uh, more traditional one. Thank you. That's, that, is that okay for the multi-tester? I, I mean, we can surely keep uh, talking afterward, and please feel mm -hmm. free to use this this, this, this space here. Uh, there was one question from Mr. Hussein. There's also a question from Camilla. Let us take those two last questions, and I don't know why they come in at the end. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, let, let's take those two uh, last questions uh, before uh, wrapping up. And, and, and thanks for the questions, by the way. Thanks for your excellent question, uh, Esther. Uh, Mr. Hussain? Thanks. But since we are talking more general, um, I beg to ask a question, which in a way relates to the validity part of the assessment. So, in many examples, many of you. The ones that they, 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 they claim to produce quality assessments, they do have the both reliability and validity measures or indicators um, that present the quality work. But sometimes they don't have that validity um, studies that validate the assessments. They, 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 they have reliability as um, in, as as an important indicator, and there are different reasons why but they may not have the studies. And my question is, the what is the price? Maybe it's more social price. Um, the price of using unvalidated assessment. Well, I think the price uh, depends on the consequences to which the results are being put. Yeah. So, in the case that the results are being put to uh, decisions that are going to affect people's life chances, the prices are very high uh, if decisions are going to be made that are wrong. Yes, following examples, message, uh, consequential, consequential validity points. How would you measure that? And if there wasn't such a measure of measuring well, in certain instances of such decisions in the field? You're not going to be able to measure it if you don't already have data about the extent to which the assessment is helping you in making decisions that are meaningful. If you don't have the data, you don't know. So if you have not validated the assessment, meaning you haven't collected the data to evaluate the extent to which it is helping you make meaningful decisions, you don't know what it is you're doing wrong in terms of affecting people's lives. That's a difficult position to be in, I think. Please yeah, yeah, yeah. we, we can keep talking after this. Uh, yeah. If uh, yeah. uh, the, the presenters uh, are willing to do that. Uh, Camilla, last question of the day. Thank you. I'm, I'm just sort of listening to the conversations, and, and I was just sort of curious to ask, because I, I hear there's two conversations in some way. One conversation is about the quality of the item. And another conversation is about what computer-based testing can offer. And I, I'm just sort of curious to know in the sense of item responsibility and if we are looking at a quality item that also measuring depth understanding, so sort of taking the item further than just yes or no. We already have that quality even though it's paper-based. Mm -hmm. And so what's, what's, what's different added from computer-based testing? I guess that's sort of, because some of the conversations, what about um, adding that quality to the item and ensuring that quality within the item, but that's not, not necessarily about uh, computer-based testing. Mm -hmm. So that differentiation between what computer-based testing can do and what uh, a quality item is. And I guess that's just sort of my <clears throat> point to be made in the sense of the conversation time, so we don't 
do the usual mistake of um, uploading technology for um, a pedagogical approach. Um, so to sort of come in question. I feel interested that, that uh, Camilla, thank you very much for the question. Um, coming back to what I was uh, trying to, um, to tell is that in the approach of re reliability and validity, also, um, let's say, the usual way of, um, of uh, checking your, the quality of your test and the, the quality of your items, nothing much has changed, you have to do it. So. Uh, there's nothing wrong about uh, doing IoT or classical test theory um, on newly developed items in CBT. So the, the value added for CBT is that you can have formats that, that are not possible on paper. And I would also like to focus on that because I've been coming back to one thing. Depend on the purpose of the test. Depend on, uh, let's say, the, the, the value added of, of the CBT. Yeah. And if there's no value added, Paper-based testing is very cheap. I can tell you, yeah. And there's nothing. And and it's, it's and and, and uh, well, Randy, I think uh, he can speak for himself. But there is a lot of testing around, without that people are are not aware of testing. You know, a classroom, uh, a classroom. Uh, there's there's almost a continuous assessment, without that it is recorded. With with computers upcoming, it might be a different way of recording. So you get the idea of big data. Collect what you can collect and see what you can do with it. Coming back to your question, it means that traditional way of, um, of uh, uh, analysis still remains. Um, time was too short to tell you something about, let's say, also innovative approaches in psychometrics, because if you have diagnostic data where the raw score in the end is less meaningful than the, all of the uh, data that you collect on, on, on the road, uh, on the road in, let's say, reflecting the process, that, that is a kind of uh, a new thing. But as that is even more costly and more elaborate than having different item formats in computer-based testing, doing treating them in a classical way. Is that is that an answer to your question? Yeah, I think. I mean, in particular, I think the process around how you get to the answer is very interesting, and that's something that can't subject to paper-based testing. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's very interesting. We we're developing an assessment for East Asia these days. And so it's a regional assessment, and uh, one of the things that we've been trying to sort of uh, introduce is that sort of literary, literacy aspects within each domain. So we're not totally interested in terms of reading, we're totally interested in the of applying the knowledge to each, each mm -hmm. domain, mm -hmm. and that also goes to mathematics and mm -hmm. how we're able to apply that in a broader context. Um, and, and some of the conversations that's been here today have, has also been about that. So it's, I guess my point is just sort of to say, this can be done with paper-based testing too, mm -hmm. but yes. the process within computer-based testing is obviously very, very interesting in this process is that we cannot observe which in uh, the paper-based testing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Okay. Randy, would you like to add something to giving effectively the last answer of today? Or, or you You're the president. Oh, oh. <laughs> I, I guess the only thing I would say is that uh, there are some skills, competencies, uh, that you won't be able to uh, address uh, on paper uh, as effectively, if at all. Uh, for example, reading online is a different kind of reading. Uh, writing online is a different kind of writing. I go about writing very differently since I have, uh, since I started writing on computer, which was very which was many years ago, but I remember how I used to write on paper and the, the different processes and uh, I get different results. Uh, so uh, there are things that uh, are, uh, are different and it's important to recognize uh, those differences. Thank you. Excellent. With that, uh, thanks very much. I would also like to recognize some of the colleagues who have helped to make this possible. First is uh, Nadia Nantou, who is sitting over there. No, we uh, maybe the last applause we can leave to last because it's, it's, it's for both of you. But first of all, also just uh, very much to uh, thank all of you for coming yes. here. It's because of your presence that it's, it's, it's really.
Yeah, it depends. So all these things here, especially in Thailand, where we're supposed to be at stations, and hope again that uh, uh, well, we hope again that, that, that you will participate in uh, such a uh, seminars. With that, let's end this with an applause for our presenters, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.